Let me start by saying a few words about the exam and then on to some different things. They'll be turned back in lab this week and they'll go over the exam. I've already posted the solution to the exam on the web page along with a bunch of other things, the solution to homework four, the empirical project outlines, today's lectures, all sorts of things. On the exam itself, <clears throat> Here's a procedure I want to follow. It's the one I always follow. It seems to work well. I want you to talk to Chris first if you have questions about how it was grading. The first step ought to be to check the solution against your answer, and that usually answers a lot of your questions. The solution is posted because that's what he used to grade. And then if you think you weren't graded properly, you think you deserve more points, I need you to go to Chris first because he has much better sense of horizontal equity. What he did for other people who gave the same answer, I don't have a good sense of exact. I didn't see all the exams, I didn't grade them all. He'll be able to be much fairer on that first pass than I am. He has full power to raise scores, lower scores, whatever um, needs to be done. I doubt he'd lower one, but you know he has that authority if he thinks it's appropriate. But Here's the thing, I told him I don't want him fighting with students, debating with students, having big, long, acrimonious discussions. If you talk to him, he says, I don't think you deserve more points, you still think you do, it's not going to turn into a big battle between you two, then come see me. I've been doing this a long time, I've graded a lot of these, I'll read it through, I'll read the whole thing through, I'll come to an assessment of myself on what kind of grade this deserves. I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of these exams in my time. I've graded them. I know what a good score is. I know what a B is. I know what an A is. I know what a class like this is capable of. And I'll be as fair as I can possibly be. I'll also look at the specific instance, and I'll have you tell me exactly why you think you deserve the points, and I'll go through it on that basis. I'll be as fair as I can be. Since this is an econometrics class, I'll put it in these terms. The null hypothesis is going to be that GTF was correct. But if there's overwhelming, I need a null. If there's overwhelming evidence to the contrary, I'll have no he hesitation to change it. And it's mostly a one-sided test. So I probably won't lower them. Uh, but uh, you know, I'll be fair as I can be. But don't expect just because you come see me, you're necessarily going to get points, or that you won't. And just turn out how it turns out. One reason for going through this is I understand the means are relatively low. I haven't had a chance to see the scores yet. I've just talked to Chris a couple times about it. I haven't actually looked through the exams. Means can vary quite a bit from GTF to GTF. That could be part of it. I'll have to make a decision on that. But um, I, I expect when we have a low mean like this that it's going to cause some people to search out more points and try to make gains. But usually when the mean's lower, you get more people looking for ways to increase their score. So I'm anticipating it will have some of that. So, um, yeah. I, I'm a little disappointed, I suppose, in the following sense. Um, I came in here last time before the exam and ready to answer questions for the whole period, gave up class to do that. I didn't really get the sense that you were prepared to ask questions, that you'd done the footwork and the study you needed to do before you got here. I then, against my better judgment, because I had things to do to get out of town, went ahead and held an extra office hour the day on Wednesday afternoon and offered you know, to make appointments and things. Maybe one person came to see me, I'm trying to remember. Maybe that was it. We didn't get much response in the lab either from what I understand. And so, you know, I, we did all we could to make the resources, resources available and it just didn't seem like the, the kind of work that needed to be done was being done by you. And so this is a hard class. If you're not doing the work, you're not going to be able to catch up and do it all two days before the exam. I hope anyone who tried to watch the videos and hasn't been coming to class realizes that's not going to work for you. And I, like I said earlier, I know what these classes are capable of. I didn't ask too much. I didn't even think I needed to give you choice on the exam. The questions were straightforward. They were right out of the notes. I gave you choice because I didn't want to strand my GTS with a bad question. So if there was one bad question on the exam, we wanted to avoid the one with calculators because for whatever reason, you were able to do that. And so, but I didn't really think choice was necessary. But even with choice, the first question I understand, you know, hardly anyone could answer what does unbiased mean. That's something you should have learned last quarter. We talked about that many times. 
when it came to the steps for Goldfeld quant test, which I wrote down on the board, had to be in your notes, almost nobody were, was able to write down those steps. That's just a sign that you didn't do the study. You didn't do what you needed to do before you, before you got to, to the test. And so you really need to help me do the work so that I don't have to do this. But so, you know, if it came out bad, the, the world hasn't ended. There's plenty of time for the final. There's homeworks that are going to contribute to your score. There's a project that's going to contribute to your score. We'll talk today. There's plenty of time to make it up, you know, and, and, and save the day. If there's substantial improvement on the final and you want me to look at that, I'll, I'm willing to look at that. But, but anyway, you just need to do the work. And my sense is, in many cases, I don't want to point in here. Somebody in here did the work. Somebody here worked, you know, day and night and got ready. And so I'm not talking to everyone. But for those who really know deep down in their hearts they didn't do what they needed to do, you really need to do better for the next test. Yes. Uh, it's final Yes, it is. As it's been for 25 years. <laughs> You're going to curve our total grades, right? No. Yes. Yes. Normed by, I mean, yes, it'll be curved, but there are limits. A 23% is probably not going to be a B, no matter how the class does. I know what we sh I should expect in that sense. And so, within limits, yes. Did uh, Chris grade all of them or just his classes? No, Chris is going to grade all of them. I don't want two graders grading these things because we'll get differences across the questions. So I never, ever allow that to happen. Sometimes I'll allow one to grade one question and one another. But I don't even like that because sometimes as you're grading, I, I, it's hard to explain, but it's just best to have one person do them all. So I've insisted on that. Are you going to do these <coughs> statistics? Or, no? yeah, I will. Okay. I, I don't have them yet. Okay. So I'm going to email you all the grade distribution okay. when I have it so that when you go to pick up your test, you'll know what grade you got. Okay. Do you have like a ballpark or anything? I do, but I'm hesitant because only 30 exams have been graded. They came from the top. And generally, the ones that turned in last are the ones that had the hardest troubles. And so I think it may be a biased estimate, and I'm, I'm hesitant to give you a biased estimate because people won't take it as biased. Let's just say that I'm, I'm hoping it turns out better than what I've heard. I'll, but I'll give you all that information. I'll, I'll open the statistics on the grade book and all that. I always open all the statistics. I don't care if you know the mean and the variance. But then again, you know, I haven't looked at the test yet. Maybe you did as well as all the other tests, and this is just a GTF that happens to be a little tougher than others. You know, it matters whether they take three or four points off when they see something, it, it affects the mean. What I need to get the grades right is that the rank order is correct. And it almost always is. So I need the good scores to somehow rise to the top and the bad scores somehow to go to the bottom. I simply, as I've told you before, use percentages, sort of norm by experience, but I just go from top to bottom and draw lines. We have guidelines on how many A's and B's a course like this should be. With, with 100 people, I can rely somewhat on large sample theory. You know, there's got to be a decent distribution of brains in this class. And so if, if nobody's doing anything, getting it right, that's probably my fault as much as yours in not giving the right incentives and encouragement along the way. And so I'm trying to change that right now and, and encourage you to, to, to start doing, you know, doing what you need to do. And the people who aren't here, I don't know. <laughs> what we do about them. I thought it was fair. Um, there were some repeats from last other classes. And I tried to give you a choice. And, I've almost always given six questions. I think I only gave five this time. So maybe. Anyway. Try that. What might have happened is the fifth week is often a, a busy, 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 busy week. And you have a lot of tests in week five. Three and seven have the same problem. I almost always give this test in week six on the Monday, so you have the whole weekend to get ready for it. On a Thursday, if you had tests on Tuesday, you don't have a lot of time to get ready for it, but so maybe there's there's also a dummy variable for a day of test that I need to throw into my regressions I'm doing in my head as I'm evaluating it, and so there is a dummy variable I've thought about that I need to. It means I probably should shift it back to that Tuesday from now on, just in case that explains some of this. So it's another thing I'm thinking about too that may have affected this. 
that has really, you know, it's about time management, but there's only so much you can do if you have three tests in a week. Okay, let's move on to more pleasant topics like Cochrane or cut procedures. <laughs> Trying to make you smile now. Is there any way to make you smile now? Put everyone on edge. Oh no, the mean's low. I didn't feel good. You should feel better that the mean's low if you don't feel good about your test, because that means you're more likely, you know, above it. That's, that's good news, not bad news. Your test is done. The lower the mean now, the better the news is. No? <laughs> you're not the outlier, is that the worry? Okay. This is something, as I said before the midterm long, long ago, and what feels like almost another land, um, that I used to make classes do, but I decided not to make this one do because it's really a tedious procedure to do on the computer. Conceptually, it's not bad. It's pretty easy conceptually, but it takes a lot of steps, iterative procedure, and it, it takes a long time for me to show you how to do it on the computer. And we're using nonlinear least squares these days to estimate these things <coughs> instead of linear least squares. And so there's really no reason to teach you how to do it because computers can estimate these another way. But this is something that anyone who goes on is going to see. And I feel obligated to present it and make you aware of what this procedure is. There's some people that still use it. And so it really is something you need to know, at least recognize, know where to find it. But I'm not going to, as I said, make you do the harder part of actually doing it on the computer. So let's suppose we have a model that has serial correlation in it. So this is just the standard model we've been using to illustrate the serial correlation problems. So these x's are, you can think of these as non-random. So the problem is not that the x's are correlated with the errors. That's not the problem in this problem. The problem here is we have correlation among the errors. So it's not a bias issue. It's an efficiency issue. Remember, if you estimate this with all s, you're fine. But it's not in terms of consistency and unbiasedness. But it's not efficient. And so that, that's the only problem here. Now, um, so how can we? Most of the fixes that we do for problems, this is true for heteroscedasticity, we found a transformation that takes the model and writes it in a new way that avoids the problem. <coughs> so the problem here is serial correlation. What we want to do is figure out how to get rid of the serial correlation and isolate just that variable. Well, we can see if I take ut minus rho, ut minus 1, that gives me ET. So somehow up here, I need to get this minus this. How can I get that? Well, I need a row UT minus 1. So if I just take YT minus 1, and I'm going to multiply through by something. So leave rule on the left-hand side of all your terms equals beta 1 plus beta 2 X2 T minus 1. So I'm just writing the model one period before. Nothing fancy here. Plus, we've done this before. T minus 1K plus UT minus 1. I didn't follow my own advice. <coughs> so all we did was lag the model once. Now, if I multiply through by rho, I can see that this minus this is going to give me what I want. So what I want to do, this is exactly what you did for the nonlinear least squares de derivation before the, the test. So what I want to do is just subtract this model from this model. So we'll get yt minus rho yt minus 1 is beta 1 minus rho beta 1. That's the constant. Plus beta 2 x 2 t minus rho beta 2 x 2 t. That's those two terms there. You just keep subtracting plus beta k x t k minus rho beta k x t minus 1 k plus 
ut minus rho ut minus 1. And this is the term that, that, that really makes it work. Now I'm going to write this one more way. Let's write it as yt minus rho yt minus 1 is beta 1 plus 1 minus rho plus beta 2 x2t two minus rho x2. This should have been t minus 1 right here. That's a typo. <coughs> ET. And ET is not serially correlated. It's not hetero. There's no problems with ET, so that, that's good. <coughs> now what we'll do is we'll write this as YT star right there. We'll call that YT star. Pretend like you know rho. Imagine that we know rho. We have to use an estimate of it, but just for the moment, imagine we know rho. Then this is. <coughs> We're going to call this whole term beta 1 star plus beta 2 x 2 t star plus beta k x k t star plus e t. So beta 1 star is beta 1 times 1 minus rho x 2 t star is x 2 t minus rho x2 t minus 1 and x k t star is x k t minus rho x k t minus 1. So those are just the definitions. So I did that very slow, so it seems to probably longer and more tedious. Than that. You just subtract one model from the other and then write down these definitions. Yes? On the model that you had ET, you have a second beta K. That should be right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Did I do it here? This is called quasi-differencing, or generalized differencing. Difference would be yt minus yt minus 1. This is quasi-differencing because we're taking some fraction of it. So it's known as quasi-differencing. That's not a term I'll ask about, though. If we knew rho and we could estimate this model, the star model, see, if we knew rho, we could calculate this on the spreadsheet. We, we've got data on yt. If we know rho, we can calculate this. We can calculate this term. We can calculate this, this. So we can form all the star variables, and we could run this regression. And it would be best linear unbiased estimator. Best linear. There still might be a nonlinear estimator instead of it's best linear. So, the problem is just getting an estimate of rho. Once we have an estimate of rho, this is fully efficient, as long as we know rho exactly. Well, if we don't know rho exactly, we have, if we have a consistent estimate of rho, then in the limit, as n goes to infinity, the rho will be correct, and this will be fully, fully efficient. So what we need to do these transformations is some estimate of rho that's consistent. Then we're guaranteed that as n goes to infinity, we'll get the right estimate. Now, consistency turned out to be one of those definitions that didn't work out so well. If I have x bar, that's the sum of the xi over n from 1 to n, that's an estimate, right, of the mean, not necessarily a true mean. But if I let n go to infinity, what does this go to? It's going to be the true mean, right?
If, I have the, if you have the whole population, here's one way to think about it. If you have the whole population, it's not an estimate, it's a true value. If it ends infinity, I have everything in the world. I've got, I've got the whole population. I'm not sampling from the population, I have the population. So the average has to be the truth. It's not an estimate anymore. This converges in the limit to the true value. So what I'm saying, that that's what consistency is. As n goes to infinity, it converges to the true mean. So when I say this is consistent, all I mean is if, if t or n gets big enough, this row that we estimate will go to the true value. That's all that consistency means. That tells us that in the limit, we have exactly what we need to do this transformation perfectly, and so it works perfectly. And then we know that the convergence is, well, we don't, you don't know this, but we can say enough about the convergence to know that in smaller, as long as the sample's big enough, the error ought to be small. It won't be perfect. We want to converge, but the error here will be very small if n is big enough. Okay, let's do the steps and move on. I want to get on to some new material today. You're tired of serial correlation. I'm tired of it, so let's get, let's get past it. So here's the steps for the Cochrane or cut procedure. So the first is to estimate the model yt is beta 1 plus beta 2 x2t plus beta k xkt plus ut with OLS. Now we're relying upon the fact that the betas are unbiased. They're not efficient because of the serial correlation in UT, but they're unbiased and they're consistent. And so therefore, we get an estimate of U that's unbiased and consistent. That's important. Because step two, so what we want to do here is save resid U hat. So you save all the residuals that you estimated. There's T of them. The second step is to estimate rho. And it's the sum from t equals 2 to t to the ut minus 1 hat, ut hat, over the sum. Did they use ut or ut minus 1? You can use either. They use t, ut hat squared from t equals 1 to t. This is the same. Well, I make that. Yeah. It's the same as a regression of ut on ut minus 1. That is, you're just running the model. You're, you're, getting, you're running this on this, and you're getting an estimate of rho by running that on that. It's just a regression of ut on ut minus 1. There is one difference. Technically, if to say that, this should be t minus 1, because I'm actually using the lag value on the right-hand side. But, but asymptotically, it doesn't matter. And we're relying on asymptotics. But basically, that's a regression of that on that. And this is the estimator for that. So that's just the estimator of row hats. So the way you would do this practically is, I think it gives you a correlation coefficient as part of the output if you want it. But the way you do this practically is you just take these u hats, regress u hat on u hat minus 1, and that estimate of row that comes out, you do it with no constant. And the estimate of row hat you get out of it is what you need. Now we're going to use these row hats to transform the data into the star variables. Then we'll run another regression. So now we've got an estimate of rho hat. And what's important is it's the, this, this is consistent. So this is consistent as well, because these are correct on average as, I go, as n goes to infinity. This is correct as n goes to infinity. And so I get the right rho asymptotically. 
to get the right value. And so with a big enough sample, I've got a, a, a good enough estimate there. Okay. Step three is to just transform the data. You just stick with my notes here. Transform data. Oh, I'm still recovering from my trip. I walked on Saturday from World Trade Center to Central Park, about halfway to Central Park and back. It was about 12 miles. And I hadn't walked for a while. It was cold and rainy. I'm sore today. <laughs> I could already stand out. Crabby. But I do it again. What's different there is there's a Starbucks, even though it's gone far, there's a Starbucks every two miles, every two blocks, every block. So when you get cold, you just go in there, get a cup of coffee and sit for a while. Keep walking. That's great. So you do these transformations, yt minus rho hat, yt minus 1, x2t star is x2t minus rho hat, x2t minus 1, xkt star is xkt minus rho hat, k minus 1. My hotel room looked right down on ground zero, which is sort of weird. You with me? Run the model, get use, run u on ut minus 1, get rho, use rho in the spreadsheet or in the data transformation part of eViews. eViews or Stata? eViews. eViews and do those transformations. Four. <coughs> Regress. Yt star on a constant. That's that beta 1 times 1 minus rho term. Beta 1 star. This is beta 1 star. Xt2 star. Xkt star. And use OLS here. estimates to get a new estimate of u hat. So to, this is going to give you beta 1 star hat, beta 2 hat up to beta k hat, right? When you, when you run this, you get beta 1 star and beta 2 up to beta k, because those are the coefficients in front of the transformed variables, if you look at the regression we wrote down. With me? Okay. This one is beta 1 times 1 minus rho. So to get beta 1, um, so what this tells you is that beta 1 hat is beta 1 star hat over 1 minus rho hat. You with me on that? We just estimated yt star is beta 1 star plus beta 2 x2 star plus beta k xk star plus ut, or et. So all of these coefficients are the beta 2 through beta k are the, the right betas. But this is beta 1 times 1 minus rho. But we have an estimate of rho hat. So that's beta 1 star, right? 
we need beta 1, not beta 1 star. So we just divide by 1 minus rho. And that gives me beta 1. So I need the beta 1 through beta k, not beta 1 star and beta 2 through beta k to do this next step. So the only weird thing here is I have to transform this constant to get the right beta 1. Once that's done, we're done, essentially. Um, do you have the big picture or are you lost in the details? So after, at step four, when we regress y to star on the constant, x to q to right. star, so on and so forth. Um, and then what that result, whatever that result is, if we divide that by 1 minus b. Just the b1 star. We divide just b1 star by 1 minus b. Yeah. So uh, this, this is the step four regression right here. And so the beta 1 star here, if you look back at it a little earlier, was beta 1 times 1 minus rho. So what you're actually, these are fine, but this one's tricky because it's beta 1 star, not beta 1. <coughs> and so if you just divide by 1 minus rho, you get the right thing back. So we run the original regression. The only reason to do that is to get an estimate of rho. We need rho. Because we need to form the star variables, because the star ones are what we want. That's when we have the right error. So we run the initial regression just to get the u's. We use the u's just to get the row. So the first two steps are just getting a row hat. Once I have row hat, the third step is just getting the variables in the right form. So the first three steps are get row hat, transform the data. That's the big picture. Then run the transform model. The trick there is beta 1 star is not beta 1. That's the only trick there. So you divide by 1 minus rho to get the right beta 1. So steps 1 through 3, use OLS to get u hat, use u hat to get rho, use rho to transform the data. Run the transform model, but be careful of the first term, the constant. That's all we've done. The rest is just chicken scratch trying to show you that. It confuses some people. Well, hopefully it's a little better than chicken scratch. OK, finally, what you do then, so now we have estimates of beta 1 hat up to beta k hat, right? That's what I just got. I got the beta 2 to beta k, and we got the beta 1 over there. So I've got those estimates. My new ut hat is yt minus beta 1 hat minus beta 2 hat x2t minus beta k hat xtk. Let me, let me bring this over here. There's not enough room to do this. The next thing is repeat steps two, three, five. That's why I'm trying to avoid erasing this, but I didn't leave myself enough room. So I'm not sure what to do. That fifth step again is what you're going to do is just find ut hat is yt minus beta 1 hat minus, beta, I'm just rewriting what I wrote too small, minus beta k hat x t k. So this is the new uh, u hat. We estimated some betas here, but they're not efficient. They're consistent, but they're not efficient. That gave us our first u hat. We used the first u hat to transform the data, and we ran a regression. That gives us new betas. They're better than the old betas. So we use the new betas to get a new u hat. Now we repeat steps, this is six, 
2 through 5 until rho changes by less than, usually, this, this is any number, usually they use 0 0.0001 is what I've always seen used, but th this is just a tolerance level. So you iterate, you keep iterating and rho will converge. It converges to the fully efficient values. So when you're all done with this procedure, when the row is finally converged, it's fully efficient, consistent, all the things that you need. So for EV step five, we could just save the resid from the step four, right? Uh, the resid, yes, and you need the row from over there. Let's see. No, no. The resid from that step is ET. Because that's the star variables. Yeah. And so that's not an estimate of UT, that's an estimate of ET. So what you have to do is you have to go back to the original model to get the, U, the UTs. So that, that's a step, that's a thing that is always a little bit tricky. So there's two tricky steps here. One is the beta one star thing. And the other is you can't use the residuals from this regression because these are the ETs, not the UTs. So you have to go back to the untangled model the original model, the non-star model, to get the UT hat. And that's what we're doing right here. Okay. You, you, is that, did I say that in a way that you get, in this sort of? I think so, it's just that wasn't ET, the non-autocorrelated UT. Right, model. right, but we need a new UT. Okay. Because we need the UT to get a new row. Yeah. And then we'll transform it again, Okay. and then just keep going. So, so what you do is, you run OLS, that gives you a, a UT, UT gives you a row, row lets you transform the data. So one through three, find row, transform the data. Run the transform model, that gives you new betas. Use the new betas to get new U's. Use the new U to get another row. Use the row to transform. Use the transform to get new U's. Use the U's and you just keep going, and it'll converge over time to the true values. And this is one of those cases where maybe actually making you do it on the computer would be helpful. I'll reconsider that. <laughs> I do not like the looks I'm getting. Let's try it one more time. I'm going to say exactly what I just said. I just want to go through it one more time and find out where you're confused. So step one is to do what? Run yt equals beta 1 plus beta 2 plus 2t plus beta k x k t plus u t, and then you save u t hat. To use the formula that we wrote down, or run u t hat on u t minus 1 hat, no constant, and that gives you rho hat. So that's all we were after was row hat, okay? Three, what do we do? There it is. More compact. So now we transform the data. So we get beta one star. We, or, the data we need is x2t star to xkt star and yt star. This is y minus rho, yt minus 1. It's always whatever it is minus rho times a thing lag. That's even true with the constant. The lag of the constant is the constant. So you get beta 1 times 1 minus rho. So you just transform the data to get this the x's and the y's. Okay, now what do we do? Run yt star on 
beta 1 star, x 2 t star, x k t star. Questions? So I probably, what you look at is the absolute value of row n minus row n minus 1, and that has to be less than. So that the absolute value of the difference has to be less than some preset tolerance value. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by transform the data? Like, what would that look like? So yt star would be yt minus row half, yt minus 1. And x t i star to through k. Well, say just x two like t four would be x t four minus rho hat x t minus one four. I'm just trying to picture e views wise. Like how would we, how would we transform it? You would run this regression, and this would be a number like 0.83. You would then say y star equals yt minus 0.83 star y bracket minus 1. So I think the command is you'd say y minus 0.83 y minus 1. Okay. These might be curly brackets. I'd have to look at the help. No. They're not? Okay, they're good. They're, they're straight. In the practice I use, they're curly. That's why. And you don't use a minus, you use a plus. Is it, use minus one for, yeah. In the package I use, that's a lead. <laughs> so I have to ask. I have to look these up. So you, that's, you would just do that. And for x, you do the same thing. You'd say, you know, x 2t star <laughs> equals x 2t minus 0.83. And that 0.83 comes from this regression that you ran here. Okay, so there we have the transform data. Then we run that on that. The fifth step then is to recover the beta hats from the star regression. Called an auxiliary regression, but I'll call it the star regression because that's probably more mnemonic. And the only tricky thing here is that beta one hat is beta one star over one minus rho hat. Beta two hat through beta k hat are just the coefficients from the regression. So you just run this, you run that regression, beta 1 hats that, and they, the beta 2s are just from the regression. <clears throat> then use the new u hat to find a new row hat. That's step two. So you repeat two to five until it converges. I might do an example of this myself next time, just in front of you all, to show you how to do it in EDUs, and that may help to make it clearer once you sort of see it in action. This turned out to be harder than I thought. So what step can I help with? Any? What can't you read that I wrote? So, like in EVs, you have to create a new beta 1 
uh, Appkin does step four. And so like towards the end, uh, when you're actually getting to the point where the coefficients aren't changing, you're going to have like a bunch of beta ones safe, essentially, right? Yeah. So if it takes seven iterations, right. you're going to get a new beta one each time. So this actually requires you to calculate that this would be, whatever comes out of this regression, you look on the regression output, it'd be beta 1 hat would be that number, minus 1, minus 0.83, if this is 0.83 again. You have to actually create that. Then when you calculate the u hat is yt minus beta 1 minus beta 2. So the way you get that u hat is just u hat is yt minus beta 1 hat minus beta 2 hat x2 minus beta k at xk. Yeah, so each time, that's going to be a different number. So, you know, if this was 2 and this is 0.83, beta 1 hat's going to be 2 over 0.17, whatever that comes out to be. And that'll be what goes right here. That's the number that will go right here. This number will come off of the, the regression. It'll be the coefficient on x2 up to the coefficient on xk. That'll give you a new u. And once you have a new u, you can just start here again. Take the u, get a row, take the row, get the stars, take the stars, run a regression, get a new u, and you keep doing it. And it'll eventually converge. But, yes? So the point of this procedure is to make row more efficient or more consistent? More efficient. It's consistent. It's consistent from step one, but it's not fully efficient. And so the iterative part of this is making it fully efficient. The iterations is causing it. You can show that that iterative procedure converges to what we call the maximum likelihood estimates. And maximum likelihood estimates are always fully efficient and consistent. So once you've shown this estimator converges to the maximum likelihood estimator, you know it's efficient and consistent. And this one does. But only after iterating. The, the use of the word converge is confusing because that's what the definition of consistent is. So that's why I was confused. Okay, and, and no, well, it does. When, when, when rho hat n equals rho hat n minus 1, it converges. And that's also when it converges to the maximum likelihood estimator. But that's the condition you need for it to converge to the, to the right. So you can start off with a row that's like 0.8 in this procedure, and it very fast. You rarely have to go through three or four or five iterations. It'll converge really fast. It's kind of like Newton's thing. But so you can start with you know 0.83, and it'll go 0.7, 0.69, you know 687, 6872, and it, it just really converges fast. So you also have a, a bunch of u hats and say. Yes. Yes. You only need them once, so it's okay to write over them. But you're going to get a set each time through. And the new, yeah, so you get one you had here, and then the rest you calculate by hand in, the, in this part right here. And you'll get a new one each time through. The whole point of this was to find a way. So when I took this class, Chico State, California, many, many years ago, to do a regression, you took a stack of cards to the computer center, and you gave it to them. They cabled them down to Northridge. And then if you didn't have more than like 200 observations or so, 24 hours later, you'd get your output back. <coughs> And then you could run another regression. So that you could run maybe one or two regressions a day at the most. And so they couldn't do nonlinear least squares. My dissertation, I had to get special permission to use two meg of memory on the mainframe. They don't let me do it between 1 and 6 AM. So I learned to stay up late. So the point is that we could only do linear regressions. We couldn't do nonlinear stuff. So a lot of what the old econometrics is about is finding a series of linear regressions that converges to, say, a nonlinear outcome. This is a case where what we've done is we've found a series of linear regressions that we can keep doing over and over and over, and it converges, and what it converges to is essentially the nonlinear estimator in the long run. But we're, we're tricking it somehow so we only have to do linear stuff. And so 
and, and because we use this for decades, people still use it. This is the way a lot of people still do it. It's, it's in all the old literature. And you know, if you're ever going to go on and use this stuff, you're going to run across this procedure. But like the book says, there's no real reason to, to, to learn it these days. Mm -hmm. So if you specified the original equation differently, specified it so it's nonlinear in some way, you can make it so you don't have to do any of this? Yeah, exactly. And that's what we talked about earlier, is what you could do instead <laughs> It's just a different version of that transformation. So I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to write it down. We, we said yt minus rho, yt minus 1 is beta 1 times 1 minus rho plus beta 2 x 2t minus rho, beta 2 x 2t minus 1 plus beta k x kt minus rho uh, x k t minus 1 plus e t. That's the right error. Then move that to the other side. What you estimate is rho y t minus 1 plus beta 1 minus rho plus all these other terms. You don't group them like you do here. You just leave them alone. This will be beta 2 x 2 t minus rho beta 2 x 2 t minus 1 plus beta k x k t minus rho beta k x k t minus 1 plus e t. That's a regression you could run, but it's nonlinear because you've got rows here and rows here, a 1 minus rho thing here. So it's nonlinear in the parameters. So you can estimate this with nonlinear least squares and get a fully efficient and consistent estimator that's better than what we did. But you have to know how to do nonlinear least squares. When you put AR1 Besides your regression and EVs, this is what it's estimating. It's yeah. doing this nonlinear regression. Okay. But this is just now becoming the standard. Only in the last five or ten years have we sort of moved away from Cochrane Orcutt, and it's, it's happening slowly. And I finally decided to flip over myself. Okay, let's just do this only and not force people to do this because the technology is there. You, know, you, you just don't need to know how to do it linear anymore. Okay. So. Someone else had a question? So did we like lose an observation? Yes. You, you, don't, you can't lag y1, so this starts with y2. There's actually a way to transform the first two variables so you don't. This is called limited information, maximum likelihood, because you throw out the first obs observation. There's a transformation you can apply to the first observation I didn't talk about that gives you what's called full information, maximum likelihood. So if you want to do that, you don't need to know this. But you would say y1 star is y1 times 1 minus rho squared to the 1 half. And the x1i, um, x say it, like kt or 2t, whatever, would be x, um, x1, oh, excuse me, this is the first one, sorry x i 1, so like 1 1 or k 1, it's the first observation, star is just x i 1 times 1 minus rho squared to 1 half. Mm -hmm. So you just transform the first two using this transformation instead of that transformation we've been talking about, and then you can use, you don't have to lose any observations, it's called full information. But then, uh, every time we do step 6 we're using other observations? No, because no, you only lag it once, so, yeah. so you're okay. Because you're going back to your original model. But you don't have to lose an observation at all if you use those transformations. Let's go on to something easier unless you want me to get more questions. Let's look at Robert Engel's arch test. Fortunately, the underlying econometrics is too hard to talk about because I don't think you know what the information matrix is from maximum likelihood estimation. It's the minus the expected value of the Hessian. 
That makes it all clear, right? So we won't talk about sort of the, the theoretical part of this. We'll just do the cookbook approach. It'll be pretty clear exactly what, what's going on here. So what we want to do is we're sort of going to mix up heteroscedasticity and autoregressions. And if you look at, well, US GDP is a good example of this. It's probably not proper, it's not proper really to use a linear trend, but just for illustration, let me, let me use that. Um, if you look at US GDP, it was pretty variable up until March of 1984, first quarter of 1984. Then suddenly the GD volatility in GDP fell by 50%. It just literally just dropped by 50% in 84. There was a big fight in the profession about whether it was monetary policy or good luck or technology or better inventory management. Exactly why that happened, and we're still fighting about that, but clearly it did happen. And then we hit the latest crisis, and we're starting to see more variability in the variance over time. This looks like an autoregressive model of the variance. It looks like the variance is following some pattern over time. So we have heteroscedasticity, but the variance today is related to the variance yesterday. So that the heteroscedasticity follows an autoregressive pattern. So this is autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity. That's what ARCH means. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, let's model the variance at time t as some constant use the same model I use in my notes, at some constant alpha zero. Plus alpha one sigma squared t minus one plus alpha p sigma squared t minus p. So we model the variance as following an autoregressive process. So that allows the variance to change smoothly over time, as we see in the data. You look at, if you look at inflation data, you see the same thing. It's a huge volatility in the 70s. After Volcker in the 80s, it's much lower. We're seeing more volatility in prices now than we've seen. And so it's clear that a lot of macroeconomic series have heteroscedasticity that looks autoregressive. It looks like it follows some pattern over time. There are lots and lots and lots of these models of the variance. This is just the simplest. There's Arch, Garch, March. There's so many E Garch and all sorts of things. We'll just go through this very basic model. But there's other ways to model that evolution. Okay, all we want to do is know is how do we test for this? If it's present, this is a case where OLS is still the best linear estimator, but if this is present, there's a better nonlinear estimator. And so you need to use a nonlinear estimator at this. In the packages, you just press the button that says arch, and it, it'll give you the right estimates. It'll estimate this right. When you go on, you can learn how to do this, the, the underlying econometrics. But it, it's, it's basically maximizing a likelihood function, which we have, we'll talk about the 10th week. Uh, have you done maximum likelihood at all? I've said that a lot. Probably have it. So. We're going to use an LM test. Can you guess what it's going to look like? How are you going to do this regression? So our model is that yt is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2t plus beta k x kt plus ut, where the variance of ut is sigma squared t, and it follows that process. So it's a standard regression model, which is the, the variance from this error follows arch. So, how do we get an estimate of sigma squared? You run this model. Oh. I was to say you run model. Yeah. Say the uh, yep. zit, and then run the resid against. Uh, Rids squared. squared against lags itself. Yeah. And a constant. Perfect. And that's going to be a 
the test statistic will probably be t times r squared. But as you pointed out, we lose observations. It'll actually be t minus p r squared. That will be chi square. And what we want to know, notice that if alpha 1 through alpha p were 0, what would the variance be? Alpha 0, it would be a constant. So our test is that alpha 1 through alpha p is 0. So our null here, so it's the test for arch, the null is that alpha 1 through alpha p are 0 versus at least 1 is non-zero. So yeah, the steps are easy. One, run yt on a constant x two t x k t. That's this regression. Save u hat t. Square it. That gives you u hat t squared. Two run u hat t squared on a constant, that's the alpha zero here, we're running this regression here, on a constant u hat t minus 1 squared to u hat t minus p squared. <coughs> Three, the test stat is T minus P. You've lost P observations because you can't lag the first observation. You can't lag sigma one. So the, the first thing you can take P lags of is the P plus first. You so you, you lose P observations here. So t minus p is the number of observations times r squared, and that's distributed chi square with p degrees of freedom, because there's p of these restrictions. So the null is homoscedasticity, the null is no arch, and the alternative is arch. So if you, if you have arch, you then have to push the button that says arch and we'll, you know, figure out in another class later on in your career how to solve that. But this is a, a sign of a misspecification error or something called in your regression model. And that should be a heck of a lot more obvious than Cochrane Orchid. Is that true? <laughs> That means you got a uh, cock and orca, it's obvious. So does that mean that um, angles arch tests can be substituted for cock and orca? No. They're completely different problems. Okay. So. Cock and orca looks at ut is rho ut minus 1 plus dt. It fixes that problem. So it tends to look at the correlation. Yeah. The Durbin Watson is the test for this. Yeah. Then we did a. a, a Bruce Bay did an LM test for this. And then the other part's the correction. The Kaufman order is a correction. This is the test. We don't have a correction. So this is something I posted last night. I want to start talking about the project. The main thing on your homework this week for lab <coughs> is to do steps one through three. So I'll post the homework tomorrow, and the first problem is finish steps one through three by the next lab. <coughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the, the project. Time to get started. So the very first step there, 
is to figure out what you want to test. So what is your hypothesis? What is it that you want to investigate? Now, um, there's a whole bunch of people in here that will want to do baseball, football, basketball, and golf because they know the data is there, they look at it all the time, and they know how to do it. That's fine, but it needs to have economic content. So I want your hypothesis to be related to economics. So if you want to do the sports thing, why is somebody paid this much? Why is this, why is this franchise valued this much? You know, some economic question is fine. Whether or not someone has a home, home field advantage and what's caused by that isn't really an economic question. And so I want that to be related to economics in some way. I'm tempted to rule out sports altogether because 70 to 80 percent of the projects are going to be about sports. But that's okay as long as they have some economic content to them. So, you know, it might be, I think money demand is related to income and the interest rate. So I'm going to run a money demand, money supply model, and I want to see if the coefficient on the interest rate is negative and the coefficient on income is positive. So just pick some theory that you want to test in economics. I want to run consumption on income, and I think the MPC is between 0 and 1. I want to test this or that, whatever it is you're testing. And so you need to be very explicit and then tell me what the theory is behind it. What are the theoretical predictions? What economic theories are you appealing to? And what are you testing? So I just gave you an example there. I want to test the money demand equation and see if it's <coughs> negative related to the interest rate, positive related to the income. And it should be negative related for these reasons and positive you know, related for these reasons. Income is a measure of the number of transactions. So the higher income, the more transactions you carry out. So you need to carry around more money. So money demand goes up. Interest rates, the opportunity cost of money. So when the interest rate goes up, you hold less of it. Those kinds of explanations. So this is what I'm testing. And again, again be very specific about that. Then you'll need to write down the econometric model that you want to estimate. So how are you going to test this? What variables are you going to use in your money demand equation? It's just going to have income and the interest rate in it. Do I need lag money demand on the right-hand side? You know, what, what exactly is my model going to look like? Do I use income? Do I use disposable income? Which one ought to be on the right-hand side? Which interest rate is the best interest rate to use? All those kinds of questions have to be addressed. Exactly what is my econometric model going to look like? Should I take the log of income? Should I take the log of money? Should I square anything? Do I have to do any transformations like that? All those things need to be specified as part of the specification of the model. So exactly how are you going to test this? What will the model look like? All, all those kinds of things. You have the sign and the interpretation of the coefficient. And then what troubles do you expect? Do you expect to have troubles with heteroscedasticity, autocorrelation? What tests will you conduct to look for those kinds of tests? Now, we haven't seen all the troubles you're going to run into yet. So some of this is going to have to be dynamic, and you'll have to change some of it later. But given what you've learned so far, what problems do you suspect your data might have? If you're using time series data, you might have arch effects, but you're unlikely to have heteroscedasticity, because that's really a cross-sectional problem. Using cross-sectional data, as many of the sports thing does, a whole bunch of teams at a point in time, you're very unlikely to have serial correlation, because that's something that happens over time. So then you're likely to have heteroscedasticity. So what kinds of problems are you likely to encounter in your data? If you're using panel data, which is a cross-section you trace through time, you could have both. What are you expecting to see in your data? What tests will you run? How are you going to look for it? Those sorts of things. Now this is the part that's critical because getting the data, it's easy to think of things you want to test. Oh, I want to test this, this would be really cool, and then you go out and look for the data, and you just can't find the data you want to find to test it. 
A lot of people will want to do something with housing. Where are you going to get housing values? Where are you going to get all the variables on the right-hand side to explain housing values? Are they available? Okay, where are you going to get your data? And I'm going to expect you to have looked up the data and to list the sources, and the data will, in fact, be there. So that later on, when you actually start doing this in week nine and three quarters, and you come to me and say, I can't find the data for my project, I just say, well, you know, that was like a week six, seven, seven thing. You should have had that done. You were supposed to have your data. Because this is going to be a hard step. Finding the data that you need is very difficult. Macro data is really easy. I could point you to all the sources of macro data that you want. You just type in FRED, Federal Reserve Economic Data. You type in FRED in St. Louis. You'll get a, all the list of the major macro data are there. They're really easy to extract. There's a button you push and it dumps it into Excel spreadsheet. So macro data comes from FRED. Micro data is harder to find, but I can give you some help there if you need it. Um, there's, there's a data set that the book uses that's out there somewhere. You can look at that data set. But anyway, um, where, you know, your data is going to be the hardest part. It's a lot easier on you than it was 10 years ago when FRED didn't exist and people had to go to the library and look this stuff up and then punch the data in themselves <coughs> because you, there was no way to do it online. So this step is way easier than it was at one time because you can just search for the stuff you <coughs> but, but trust me, don't gloss over this step. Really, you know, this is going to be the hard part. And you may find a hypothesis you want to test. You go look through the data and you just can't find it. You may have to go back and pick a new hypothesis until you find something that works. So it's, it's a bit of an iterative process. Then this isn't due yet, but the next steps in the project will be, you know, what estimation tech will you use? What problems will you test for? How are you going to correct for problems if you, if you find them? And so that will be, you know, look for all this stuff in the write-up. What hypotheses are you going to test? Pick your significance levels in advance, those sorts of things. And then do some forecasting and prediction. This project, this warning at the end, what I tell my PhD students is take a really, really, really liberal estimate as, a, as to how long this will take you and then triple it. And that's probably a slight underestimate of the time it's going to take you. This will take you longer than you think. The first time you run the regression this is not going to come out right. The coefficients are going to be all screwed up. You're going to have problems you need to fix. Trust me. Don't wait to do this stuff. So I'm going to have benchmarks along the way. The next homework will require you to have run certain regressions and so on. At a certain time, I'll want you to have written up certain parts of this. I'm going to try to push you so this doesn't happen to you. But again, I can't make you do your homework. If you wait, you're going to find that this takes way, 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 way longer than you think it's going to take. So really, I, I just I can't say that strongly enough. Get started early. Get this down early. Get your data early. Run the regressions as soon as you can. When you find the problems you're going to find, come see me. Come see the GTFs and get them fixed, and you'll be fine. But if you wait, you won't be so fine. Um, now, the other part here that I think is important is um, when the project is finished, it may or may not turn out the way you hoped. You may find that the coefficients on income and the interest rate are just backwards or something. Oh, man, this didn't work. You know, you can be all frustrated. And, and you know, I'm not going to grade you on how clever you were at finding interesting things or whether when this is all done, you, you found something that really shakes up the world or something new. I don't care about that. What I care about is that you show me you know how to use the tools and techniques in this course. So you can choose the most mundane project you want. I don't care if it's flashy. I don't care if you're finding out something important or not, or if it's something that's been done in the past. Your job is to illustrate to me that you know how to test for hazardous gases. You know how to test for autocorrelation. You know how to correct for it. You know all the things we've talked about here and know how to handle those, those kinds of problems. And so your real goal is simply to do the test, do the corrections, and illustrate to me I know what to look for. I know how to test for it. And I know how to, to correct for it if we've done those kinds of corrections. Some of you will get lucky. You'll test for heteroscedasticity and you won't find it. You'll test for autocorrelation and you won't find it. In those cases, what you want to do in your project is tell me, this is what I would have done had I found it. Then I'll know you know how to do it because that's what I'm looking for. In this model, I needed to test for autocorrelation. I used the Durbin-Watson statistic. I didn't find it, but if I had, I would have corrected for the problem in this way. And then, and then you're going to be fine in terms of getting full credit on the project. 
And so again, this is your chance to show off that the test was an aberration and you actually do get this stuff. Is this project in the benchmarks replacing the weekly assignments? Yes. Um, I'm not fully sure I get the question. Are we doing weekly homework assignments or are the benchmarks basically like replacing the weekly homework assignments? It'll be in addition to. In addition, okay. No, I didn't do it yet. Um, the next homework, one of the problems is complete steps one through three. There's also a problem in the book. And so this isn't the whole part of your next homework. So you'll get a homework called post it to our afternoon. Problem one is something like do steps one through three on the empirical project outline. And then um, there's another problem and another problem after that that are completely different from the project. The next homework will say get this far in your project and there'll be other stuff. But I just want to keep having you turn things in the lab that force you to stay on track with the project. I've learned if I just leave it to you to hit your own benchmarks, it's easy to discount and push things into the future. So I'm trying to cure that myopia. More on the project questions? I'm going to start a brand new section next time that I hope is a little clearer and easier. We'll see. I always hope that.